Mr. President. Uh, as a former Prime Minister and former President of the European Commission, what do you think about the solution of a non-political government for a country like Romania in times of mistrust regarding the politicians? This is an um, internal issue of Romania uh, and I don't want to interfere now in internal politics. As you know, now I'm no longer in office. So what I'm going to give you is a very personal of opinion. Uh, as um, someone who likes to follow politics, but of course uh, I have no authority today uh, to, to elaborate very much on that issue. We know in democracies that sometimes there are situations where some kind of independent and sometimes even people call them technocratic of exactly. governments are necessary because there was some kind of blockage in the um, normal functioning of political parties or of the political system. So if the rules of democracy, the respect for constitution is assured, I see no problem, frankly. We have had that in my country, for instance, since you mentioned it, it happened several times. And in other countries in Europe as well, just recently, remember what happened when, the, for instance, Mr. Monti was, uh, exactly. became prime minister of Italy and uh, not being elected, but uh, because there was uh, some kind of crisis or also in Greece, it happened also when Mr. Papademos became prime minister. So it's something that is relatively normal. And uh, if the government has the confidence of the parliament and if the normal functioning of the institutions is kept, I don't see uh, any any problem, frankly, I don't but see as it. You see it as a long-term solution? I mean, long-term, uh, it depends on what you call long-term. Like uh, uh, four years or...? No. I, I think that uh, the, that's for the Romanian uh, citizen and the Romanian democracy to solve. I cannot comment on that. Uh, but frankly, uh, the normal thing in a democracy is that the political parties present their candidates and afterwards there are majorities. If there are no majorities, there are coalitions. That's a normal thing. Now, uh, a system of a democracy uh, has always some kind of plasticity. There is always a possibility for the regime, in the respect of the values and of the constitution, to adapt to different situations. And I, I cannot now make a comment uh, that could be misunderstood in the Romanian context. Okay, you have been president of the European Commission for 10 years. What would you say was the most memorable and the most difficult moment, moment in the, your relation with Romanian authorities during these uh, years? I mean, the most memorable, uh, there were, I, of course, I was very happy the day of the accession. As you know, there were people who were opposing the accession of Romania to the European Union. And the fact that we have concluded negotiation and that happened in itself was a great moment. Afterwards, um, generally speaking, error, things went well. There was uh, that crisis, you remember, when there was the conflict between the prime minister and the, or the, or the party of the government with the president of the republic, where we believe uh, we were um, in a constitutional crisis. You mean 2012? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm not so good in dates, but... Uh, and then the European Commission had to intervene to be sure that uh, all the rules of the uh, democracy and the rule of law principles were, were respected. But uh, it was relatively easy, this issue to, to be settled. Uh, and, um, and so, but that was delicate from a, an institutional point of view, frankly, yes. It, it was delicate, but I spoke at that time with, the, it was President Pazesco, it was Prime Minister Ponta, and I think both of them understood. I always, I also have some kind of a very discreet role of mediation. Uh, and I think they both understood that my interest was to see uh, Romania stable and respected. But that was some kind of, of a delicate moment, yes. Okay. From, a, from a political point of view. Economically, there were also difficult moments. But then uh, Romania basically was able to respond. We have a program, as you know, balance of adjustment program, and Romania was reacting positively. And I was always pushing 
for uh, supporting Romania in that moment, also speaking with the International Monetary Fund and others. What would you advise the Romanian authorities regarding the process of entering the Eurozone? I mean, Romanian authorities settled a goal like 2019. I'm not familiar now with the exact state of preparations. I think the goal should be kept now if it is which year I, I cannot comment. I, I frankly I think it's more prudent for me not to comment. But what uh, what does this, the euro bring is very important in terms of investment. We have seen that, uh, for instance, Slovakia, it went very well, the euro. Uh, I know that the latest events regarding the euro situation were sometimes uh, creating panic uh, in other, in public opinion in other countries. But frankly, uh, if you make a serious uh, bilan, a serious assessment of what happened in the euro, we see that it was good. Europe would be in a much more difficult situation if there was not the euro. We'll, we would have had um, uh, competitive devaluations, we'll have the fragmentation of the market, uh, some of the European biggest companies would not invest so much as they invest in Europe, they would go elsewhere. So the euro, in fact, is an anchor of stability. And so I think it is in the interest of, of Romania to join the euro when uh, Romania is ready. Now, when is this? Uh, that depends mostly on your, your, your progress. This year, Romanian authorities uh, should uh, have to select new people in uh, top-level position in justice system like uh, national anti-corruption uh, agency and so on. What will be again your advice? Uh, what kind of process should the they... Advice, I mean, is always to be, to be bold on these matters. I mean, a government, a politician that is honest uh, as, is not afraid of independent authorities. These authorities have to be independent uh, and those who occupy those functions have to be above any, uh, any form of suspicion. Uh, people with integrity, and this is very important. So I, I hope that the authorities of Ukraine will have the courage to nominate people that are really above uh, any suspicion and that they've already proved, uh, given evidence of their integrity, because that's very important for the image uh, of Romania. And I think about that matter, you cannot be half honest. Either you are honest or you don't are, or you are not honest. So to to have the courage to have independent uh, authorities and to nominate them according to the rules uh, of democratic of democracy and the, the respect of democratic values. Coming back to the European Union, you spoke about solidarity in your speech today, about more cooperation between states, about more Europe in this uh, refugee crisis and so on. But uh, we see that the European Commission has a position, but when you look at uh, states, every state has its own position and sometimes they collide. What would you see as a solution of more cooperation between European Commission and uh, European Commission and the uh, states? I think it's very important to show cooperation. Uh, for me, it's quite clear that the, even the great countries, the bigger countries, I mean, in economic terms or demographic terms, on their own, are not able to solve all the problems. And the smaller countries or the not so rich countries also need the support of others. So uh, there is a, a word that we say it's compromise. And it's very important to explain this to the public. When we are in a union, we cannot get everything we want, you see, even the big countries. So we have to give something to take something. That's the a compromise uh, with balance. Um, and this is what my advice for the governments not to to create unrealistic expectations, not to pretend we are going there to Brussels and we are going to say no, and then uh, we are going to be the winners. No, I mean, we need to have a collective situation in Europe of cooperation. That's my, my advice. And I think also the new member states uh, uh, that are, by the way, benefiting from the structural funds, because, which is natural, because these are cohesion countries, uh, they should... Uh, always think the following. We are not in the European Union just to receive. We are also to give, to give security, to give cooperation. Uh, because, as you know, uh, I'm a really a passionate of the enlargement. I believe it was one of the greatest achievements ever of the European uh, continent and also of the international relations that uh, 
The European community started with six countries, now has 28 countries. But there are people who are not happy with that. There are people who believe that it was better to have a small Europe only for the richest countries and the others, okay. Uh, second class countries. No. The new member states are not second class countries, are first class countries. But for that, they should also cooperate in all the important matters and not to say, look, this is only your business. Uh, you know, that's the way to be in Europe. And that's the way to get respect for the others, and I think it's very important. But what do you think about the refugee quota uh, that the European Commission wanted to uh, impose and some member states opposed? It's uh, not imposed what it's the European Commission wants to impose. Mandatory, uh, sorry, mandatory, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's obvious, uh, I think, that uh, um, the rules as they were, they will not work because, uh, for instance, Malta. Malta is a very small country. It's an island. I mean, if uh, uh, the refugees, all of them come there, I mean, they, they have no space. There is no possibility to receive them. So the European Commission made a very sensible proposal. It's OK, let's make some kind of a, a sharing of this responsibility. Now, this has to be done progressively. I understand the sensitivity in, in some countries because they are not used to multicultural societies. They are not used to receive so many people in such a short period. I understand. I'm not criticizing uh, on an irresponsible way. I was prime minister and I know that sometimes uh, we cannot uh, expect uh, magic solutions. Having said that, it is obvious that everybody has to give a contribution. Those who are richer can do more, but, those, uh, but there is always space to accommodate some people, you see. For instance, my country is not a rich country, but you know what happened in my country? Almost all the mayors at local level said, OK, we can receive one or two families. And if it is like that, I mean, multiply. So the problem can be solved. But, uh, but of course, if you, give, if you give the impression, now there is going to be one million and we are going to be as um, overburdened by that, of course the people start to become worried and that's going to give arguments to the anti-Europeans. Now, but if we divide the problem, if you say, okay, uh, in your country, one municipality, you can have five families, you can have five families. I mean, we can solve the problem because Europe is very big. We have more than 500 million people. So we can perfectly receive the refugees. And it's a matter of, of solidarity uh, or human feeling, humanitarian. Look, I, I sometimes say, if I was a Syrian father, I have three kids and now I have two grandsons. If I was a Syrian father, if my town was destroyed, I will do everything to save my family, to come to a place where I could live in peace. So the Romanian people have to think also like that. It could happen to us. It's not here, it's another part. But we have to show solidarity. Now, of course, this has to be done in a, in a progressive manner, uh, but I think uh, we can do it. If you allow me a question about the terrorist threat, what uh, would be the solutions to, to somehow... Terrorist threat to... is to fight against them without pity, huh? because these guys are trying to destroy our societies and are killing uh, civilians like it happened in, in Paris. And uh, one thing does not mean the other. While we have to be generous towards refugees, we have to be tough against terrorism and criminals that are exploiting human trafficking. And once again, this can be done only by European cooperation. Because the terrorists do not respect borders. So if you want to be effective against terrorists, we have to have better cooperation between the police and intelligence services of Europe reinforce our external border. This is necessary. It has to be, you have to be very tough on that matter. So we need solidarity towards refugees and re uh, responsibility in terms of reinforcing our mechanisms of defense and security. And this is perfectly possible to do. And we have to have the courage to go against the populists and the nationalists that are lying. They are saying that it is because of the European Union or because of Schengen that we have this. This is false. Let's imagine, just for a moment, that there was no Schengen. Let's imagine that there was no European Union. Does anyone believe that we will not have the problems of refugees or uh, terrorism? Of course, the refugees will try to come 
uh, all the same in Europe. They come to Europe because here there is peace, there is stability, and there is prosperity. That's why they come here. By the way, they don't go to other countries, they come here. And does anyone believe that if there was no Schengen or there was no European Union, there would be no terrorism? Look what happened now in the United States. I, I'm now spending most of my time in the United States. Just recently, in San Bernardino, in California, there, were, there was a couple of fanatic people that started shooting people uh, in a, a kind of a center for old, old persons. So in the United States there is also terrorism. Or in Malaysia, or in, a, uh, some <coughs> in Turkey. Turkey is not a member of the European Union. Well, the problem of terrorism is not because of the European Union. On the contrary, it is with better cooperation between the European Union countries that we can defeat terrorism. And if you have a short message regarding the situation in Republic of Moldova, uh, as you may know, there is a political and social crisis there, a very uh, difficult one. So what uh, would be the, most, the approach that the uh, European Union and Romania should have? My message is following. Uh, do the best in Moldova for national dialogue. This country needs desperately stability so that it can complete the reforms to define its future Europe, future with Europe. Uh, I visited Moldova several times. I know that the people of Moldova want to be closer to Europe, but for that they have to show stability, avoid the, op the extremes, um, negotiate an agreement with the IMF, because uh, in financial terms there is a very serious and difficult situation, to fight corruption, because this country has been victim of uh, uh, corruption, um, and to make that effort. We can support from the outside, and I know that Romania uh, can be a great support because of the very strong uh, historical and cultural links between Romania and Moldova. And I want to thank Mo Romania for everything that Romania has been doing for Moldova. I remember that uh, every time there is a discussion about Moldova, uh, Romania is really the front line of trying to support. But we have to be honest, we cannot replace the Moldovans themselves. It's the Moldovan society that has to uh, find some basic, let's say, um, convergence, some compromise between the different forces. We in Europe are ready to support, not choosing the party A or party B, supporting the democratic forces, for they make their reforms, they fight corruption, and in that case they will have a European future. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you. Thank you. Again.